All right, Romans 11. I wrote on the board here of the riches of the world. Now, if you had talked to a lost person, they'd figure what? Money, right? Yeah. They'd be, you know, talking about money. In Romans 11, verse 1, I say then, that, that I say then in respect of chapter 10, starts out about Israel. Chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel as they might be saved. And the Apostle Paul knows that there is a day when Israel will be saved. But he's not talking about that day in the future. He's talking about that Israel could be saved through his ministry. Okay? He said, For I bear them record to have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Zeal will never save you. Zeal doesn't even help save you in most cases. As a matter of fact, sometimes it'll hinder you. Uh, zeal has nothing to do with understanding even. He says in verse 2, For I bear them record to have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Um, for years that was called zeal without knowledge. That was the terminology used. I had that when I was younger. I uh, had great zeal without knowledge. And uh, uh, I, I believed you ought to do this or do that. And Well, that's why I cut my ponytail off and quit drinking beer and everything else. I had a zeal, but I didn't have no knowledge. Uh, I didn't have to do any of that to have salvation. But I didn't know that. Now, in verse 3, and, and if you were to talk to Paul about this and him talking about Israel, Israel, their stumbling block was their table. They had a sacrificial table that they offered. And a sacrificial table is always based on the fact of a sin. And his idea here was that their table caused them not to see the Lord. Think about your neighbors. Why don't they see what you see? I mean, it's written, ain't it? Mm -hmm. don't, uh, don't your neighbors that go to church believe in the Holy Bible? Mm -hmm. Say they do. Well, what's in the Holy Bible? Holy words. Mm -hmm. Why don't they see then what Paul says? Because of the zeal without knowledge. All right, verse 3. Well, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. All right, what was God's righteousness? What was it? The cross. What if God takes away the law? In accordance to the Old Testament, performing the law is your righteousness. Mm -hmm. Right? Deuteronomy 6 25. So if He takes the, we'll put righteousness with the law here. Okay? And it'd be your righteousness, Israel. We'll use them for the reference. And. What if the law was abolished? Then what are they going to do for righteousness? Come on, folks. What does your neighbor plan on going before God with? Their righteousness. What do they believe is their righteousness? Work, going to church. That's one of them. Yeah. Uh, tithing, tithing. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, and uh, uh, doing things in the church, helping being other a good people. person, helping your neighbor, that person. that kind of thing, right? So they expect that to to stand up when they go before God. That that'll be their goodness outweighing what? Their bad. Okay. Now, <clears throat> righteousness only comes by the works of the law. Who fulfilled the law? Jesus Christ did. No, oh, the law has been taken out of the way. It's a standard gone. The standard's been set higher than you can ever accomplish in the first place. All sin comes short of the glory of God. Now, what if God takes out in the book of Acts, we have a man that can worketh righteousness. Mm -hmm. Now, what is that? What's working righteousness? Probably baptism or circumcision. I don't know. What did Cornelius do to work righteousness? Law, fear God, and work righteousness. What did he do in Acts ten? He blessed. 
He blessed Israel. He helped them. He gave them alms and gave them money. Okay? So money's involved, right? Now, what if all advantage of a Jew went away? Well, we know that the law's gone. Now the work in righteousness is gone. Now what do you got? What are you going to do now? righteousness. You're just, is, that what, is that what they call level ground at the cross? If, if I can't work righteousness because there's not a Jew to bless, and I can't do the law because the law's been fulfilled, so I, I, I can go no farther with the law. It's fulfilled. Then what do I do? Romans 11. No, uh, I apologize. Romans 10, 4. Now let's go back to 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness and not submitting themselves unto the righteousness of God. How many people in here like the word submit? Uh, that's a hard word in a lady's language with a man, right? Submit. Um, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believe it. Then if a person believed that Christ was the end of the law, what would God impute to him? Righteousness. Righteousness. Right? Now chapter 11, verse 1, I say then, had God cast away his people, God forbid, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God had not cast away his people which he foreknew. Alright? Then, <clears throat> does he foreknow somebody? Mm -hmm. Alright? If he foreknows a Jew, then obviously every one of them he foreknows, he's going to get. Correct? Okay. God did not cast away his people which he foreknew, wrought you not what the Scripture say of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dead down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men of who, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So, at that present time, when Paul's writing, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Works. Okay. Now look at verse 11. He said, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? It is not the plan of God to make them fall, but He lets them fall. Just like a day in your life, God will let you believe. He won't make you believe. He'll let you believe. If He makes you believe, then that's no choice. Right. So there's a day in your life when He knows the condition, He knows how you're feeling, He knows what's going on. And he knows what's preached. And in that day in your life, you go from being lost to saved. You go from being an individual that doesn't know the truth to a person that has accepted the truth. Okay? <laughs> Verse 11, I say that they stumble, they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Well, there's two things. What does it take Israel to do for the Gentiles? What do they have to do? fall. What will it do to the Jews if the Gentiles accept? Provoke them to jealousy. Now, verse 12, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my office. Then, what was the purpose of God's Son appearing to Paul? Does God know then that He's going to fulfill the law? Does He know that it's going to come a point where they're going to fall and diminish and cast away? Well, if they do, where's Peter's ministry? <coughs> you see, the last Gentile that Peter preaches to worked righteousness. You with me? Go to Acts 10. Watch. Come on, folks. You look at the order of this laid out in the Bible and you understand that God reveals something to this man Paul and your, your preachers and your neighbors don't know it undoubtedly. Or they don't want to know it. 
<coughs> in Acts chapter 10, there's a day in a man's life when uh, an angel appears to him and says, your prayers and alms come up before God. If an angel came to you tonight and told you that, you'd probably have a heart attack. <laughs> Verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius a centurion of the man called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. You just got it listed what the man has been doing. Mm -hmm. And that is not always. That is always. All the way. That is like praying, even though he didn't hear God, even though God didn't talk to him, he did it anyway all the way. With no reserve, this man, is an, he's an outstanding individual when you think about this because Israel has a God. This God is able to perform works, wonders, and signs. And this man prays to this God of Israel and never hears Him. I mean, you heard God lately. What did He say? I need whatever, help. Whatever it says in here. Did God talk to you this morning? What did He say? Did anybody, I mean, did He talk out loud to you and say, Yes! <laughs> Does it get discouraging that you don't ever hear Him? Yes. Does it get discouraging you never see Him? Yes. Does it get discouraging that you never know how it's coming? Yes. But do you walk by faith? Mm -hmm. Well, this man here, he's been helping Israel. He's been giving alms. He's praying. And he don't know whether God's listening to him or not. So this is a blessed day in his life. Mm -hmm. Verse 2, uh, 3. He saw in a vision early about the ninth hour of the day. The ninth hour of the day, that'd be about 3 o'clock. Daylight would start at 6 in the morning. It would be about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, ninth hour. About the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. Now that got his attention, didn't it? Mm -hmm. If you have a vision and an angel says your name, <laughs> isn't it a pretty sure thing that that will get your attention? Yeah. yeah, I'd say so. He says, he looked on, uh, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Oh my goodness. A day of announcement. It is like a day of birth. Something comes into the world. Okay? And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon whose surname is Peter. Can you explain to me, is Cornelius a Roman? He's a Gentile then, right? Mm -hmm. Who's the apostle of Gentiles? <clears throat> Why is Peter going to him? The word righteousness. That's right. That's right. So you understand, this is where Peter's ministry is. In, in other words, Peter's ministry is over here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The words are taught to him in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5. Then he be, he gives to expound unto them the words he's taught and the kingdom of God. And now, all of a sudden, in Acts chapter 10, something has changed with God, and God has opened the door to a man that didn't know whether he'd ever get hurt or not, but he's faithful in it. There was a man in the Bible that carried the stuff and did the work and never knew he was going to be part of the ministry until Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 1. And the lots were cast upon him and he became one of the twelve apostles because one of the apostles gave up his right to eternal life, gave up his right to be in the presence of the Lord and took the son of perdition position instead. Which one do you think is going to be happier in the end results? In Matthias. I'd say. Well, which is going to be happier? The day that the Lord calls you up or the day you get left? Don't you ever sit and meditate and think about what God's going to show you out there? Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to these movies and they and their imaginations run wild and they try to make it look like things out there, you know. And they haven't got a clue 
to what is really out there and what God has created, and He's going to let you see it all. Mm -hmm. You will meet Paul. Mm -hmm. You will re meet the people you've read about. And you will see loved ones if they got it. How would that be? You'll hurt no more. You'll have a glorious body. You'll have a, the, the presence of God with you at all times. And the things that He'll let you have, you will have because you lost your pride one day. Because he was willing to agree with God and he knew what he was doing. Amen. Well, he does know what he's doing, thank God. In Acts chapter 10, verse uh, 5, Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges one Simon a, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he shall tell thee <clears throat> what thou oughtest to do. Well, you reckon Cornelius will do this? Sure he will. He's probably happy to. Well, what if God said study? You reckon you'll do it? <coughs> you think? Do it until you just get uh, tired. And that there usually happens about the time you start. What's more important to you? The Bible or your life? Bible? Huh? The physical part or the words? What do you think is more important to you, the Bible or the living every day? The Bible's not The majority of the time when you can't read is because you have something else to do, right? Mm -hmm. How important is it? Now, you told me God didn't talk to you lately. Well, as far as I know, He probably won't ever talk to you except in the Word. Right. So how much you been talking to him lately? Mm -hmm. Now, if something in your possession gets hurt or gets lost, then you will call on the Lord. We're quick to do that, right? It don't take much for a human being to call on God, does it? Mm -hmm. Right? Don't you want to know what he says? See, that's the key to it. We think so much more about other things than we actually do what it says. And it would be a lot better. I mean, when I read, I get overwhelmed of how of much of an idiot I am. How, how ignorant I am to just the power. I, there was something I was reading. Turn with me to Jeremiah. I'll show you something. Jeremiah 11. In Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. So it would be pretty important, number one, for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, uh, Judah and the, inhabitants, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they might or look at the covenant. Right? Correct? Yeah. Wouldn't it be a good idea to look at the covenant if you were them so that you'd know not to break it? All right. Okay? Which I command commanded your fathers in that day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you, and so shall ye be my people, and I will be your God. Now Paul quotes a type of this in 2 Corinthians 6, be not unequally yoked together, and he lists them in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to the end of the chapter. And it, it, it's, it's a warning to the Corinthians. Okay? Now he says in verse 5, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your father, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Lord. Now, 
Verse 6, Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and do them. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in that day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even of this day early rising, arising early, and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Do you know what Proverbs 8 says? That you should be at his gates daily. The gates are like when you open the book, it's like opening gates. And he said be at the gates daily. Okay? Now, you ever read anything in the Bible and said, I didn't know that was there? Ignorance is not bliss, but whatever. He said in verse 8, Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore will I bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to iniquity of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words, and they went after other gods to serve them, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, have broken my covenant which I made with their fathers. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. Though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto gods unto whom they offered incense. But they shall not save them at all at the time of their trouble. For according to the number of the cities were their God, thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have you set up altars to that shameful thing, even to altars that burn incense unto Baal. Therefore pray not thou for this people, and he's telling Jeremiah this, neither lift up a cry or a prayer for them. I mean, you, you hear what they're saying? Mm -hmm. Jeremiah ain't going to ask for nothing for them. I mean, this is getting deadly right here. Okay? For I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. Who hath my beloved, uh, what hath my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee? When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. The Lord called thy name a what? Green olive tree. A green olive tree. Now where do you reckon that's going to show up? Romans 11. The green olive tree. The, the thought of the green olive tree and whatever. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit, with the noise of great tumult. He hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. Now turn back to Romans 11 and watch. God prophesied this in Jeremiah. Then he's going to call a man named Paul. Why? What is the green olive tree going to do to their Messiah? We have no king but Caesar crucified. Am I missing you here? I, I don't want. I want you to see it. The green olive tree. He said that was his fair plant. Uh, there, there's lots of things about the oil of the olive and on and on. These green olive tree have become wild. You know why? Because they became part of the Gentiles' way. They married their daughters and their sons. You know. I wasn't messing with you a while ago. You don't hear God because God don't talk to you. He gave you His Word. Yeah. That's how important that Bible is. And so a Gentile, he didn't hear his God, so he made his gods in his image. The way he wanted them to look. The Grecians made their gods beautiful and muscular and uh, they had a lot of things, you know. They have the host of heaven. But... They didn't hear their gods either. But they would talk like they heard their gods, but they didn't hear their gods. But they made images. Israel had a God that talked to them. 
I mean, he talked to the prophets. He talked to Moses. He talked to the kings, the judges. But the Gentiles, he wasn't talking to them. Why? Because he wasn't their God. But now he is your God. How do I know? We've got it in the Word of God. Now watch, Romans 11, verse 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world. The what? What did I write on the board here? The riches of the world. Now, what's the matter with the world? Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered the world. And death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all of sin. All right, the riches of the world be the uh, be the riches of the world, and to diminish in them the riches of the Gentiles. How much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, insomuch as I am the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to the emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. All right, Paul's ministry is to go to the Jew first, and hopefully they'll get saved. And he's not talking about the second coming of the Lord. He's talking about the availability of a Jew to trust the Lord by grace. Okay? Verse 13, uh, 4, 15. For if the casting away of them be the re re reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild what? Olive tree. That's where the wildness. Okay? So is a Gentile a wild olive tree? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? Wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee, and on and on. Now, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until what comes in? Until the fullness of the Gentiles. Then God knows every Gentile. Mm -hmm. Well, that's curious when I go to Matthew and he said there'll be a time of a judgment when he said, Depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew you. You are sitting in a room tonight and God took a time to know you. Turn to 2 Corinthians, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 6 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech ye also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I've heard then a time accepted. All right, was there a time when he heard Cornelius? Mm -hmm. Did Cornelius? know that until the vision. But he kept on doing it, right? right. Okay? This, this scripture says, For he saith, I've heard thee in a time accepted. Hold your finger, go to Romans 10, and watch. I own nothing, I breathe nothing, I see nothing that God didn't give me. I have nothing unless God gave it to me because this is His world. He owns it, he owns it all. He owns the creation. It's His. And He saw fit one day in my life to let me do and see what Romans 10 says. Now watch Romans 10, 9. That thou should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Tell me what's missing in that verse. Baptism. Baptism. Repentance. And sins. There's no confession of sins there. Right? Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Alright, what would they have to believe in this verse, or you even would have to believe to have righteous imputed to you. What's the foundation you have to believe this? The Lord raised. Thus He is the Son of God. Remember, a Jew, he believed that Jesus' body was stolen. 
You got to think about the things that happened to Saul as he presented and Paul presented this message. How they stoned him to death, shipwrecked, beat him, perils. He was in, uh, I think he was whipped 39 times, five times. 39. He was beaten 40 times, one, less than one stripe, five times for believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and presenting him crucified. He was in shipwreck. He was in the water for a night and a day. Floating. And he did all of this. He was in prison. He was in jail. And all of this because that the Lord opened the door up through him and the world avoids him today. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of being a Paulite or whatever they call you. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and that's what Paul delivered. Well, look in this verse. He said in verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession made unto salvation. Confession of what? That he is the Son of God. Amen. Okay? Well, then where's the confession of sins? Paul cannot preach that to someone. Now, verse 11. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Well, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all them to call him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? preacher? Okay. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? Turn to Isaiah 53. See, these are the things that Paul quotes, so you go look at them. Verse 1, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I want you to get that. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2. 1 Corinthians 2. Hold on to that. Go to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter one, uh, 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Uh, the testimony of God. Can you give me a verse for that? Romans chapter 4, verse 24. What does it say, Lee? But for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Oh, wait a minute. That's not Jesus we're believing on. Who are we believing on in that verse? God. The testimony of God then, if we believe on the testimony of God, if God says something to us and we believe on that, then we will have something imputed to us because that whole chapter is about the imputation of righteousness. <clears throat> Why? You ain't got no possibility of righteousness. That's right. There is none righteous and you ain't got no possibility of it now if the law's gone. Mm -hmm. You got no possibility of working righteousness if there is no Jew advantage. You with me? And both there's got to be a reason for everything you look at in the Bible. Listen, signs and wonders are legitimate in the Bible. Yeah. Why they quit is legitimate. Titus and the Roman army came in in AD 68 and destroyed the temple. The destruction of the temple is the absolute giving of God's knowledge to you that there is no advantage of being a Jew any longer whatsoever. And that's why the Ephesian and Colossian letter are so outstanding in the fact that it has nothing to do with blessing a Jew or being part of a Jew or being part of an olive tree or anything else. It has nothing to do with that. Why? We were aliens, strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, we have it all. Yeah. The riches of the world. You got it all, folks. You didn't get just some of it. You got all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. You got all the inheritance that He'll give you and all the things that are available to you and you sit like a dead log. Come on, folks. We're in, you ain't even smiling. My God. Wah, wah. <laughs> God gave you everything by grace. 
And this is just a short pilgrimage through this world. For eternity is long. And it's forever. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Well, read the 25 too, Lee. Who was delivered, well, I, who was delivered for our offices and raised again for our what? Justification. There's a day in God Almighty's knowledge and His Son is delivered up. His Son suffers everything that the creation will give Him. They hate Him, they beat Him, they expose Him, and they want Him dead. He is the greatest hero that ever lived. He is the greatest individual that ever lived on earth. He's the kindest individual to ever live on earth. He's the one that loved the Lord thy God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength and kept the law perfectly. This individual loved children. He healed. He did everything right. And we as the world hated him. First Corinthians 2, 1 again. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, <coughs> declaring unto you the testimony of God. <coughs> Two words you don't want to associate with God. And they're in here. Two words that I've been at, they don't ring off your lips right. First Corinthians 1, um, 25. <laughs> about it? Did you go around yesterday and think about the foolishness of God and the weakness of God? What does that verse say? Did you die? What did it say? That don't, they don't roll off your tongue real good, does it? Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now that's not two words you want to think about your God about, is it? How do I associate this kind of verse? Alright? The weakness of God. He let His Son die. How'd that look? What should the King of Israel done? Where should He have been born? In the palace. Right? Where was he born? In a manger. What's in the manger? Hey. And doo-doo. Mm -hmm. It's a barn. Mm -hmm. So how does that look in the world? Don't look like their king. Okay. When he lives on earth, at 12 years old, he hadn't been to school and he found the wisest men in Israel. He goes exactly where to go in the Bible and read. He goes to the Scriptures and read to a certain point then shuts it right there. He knows exactly where to shut it. I imagine they're going, why did he shut it there? Because he had a reason to shut it there because that's where he was going to go. So he's looking. He's not a wise man in their eyes. This man... This boy at 12 and then at 30, he's undoubtedly not been educated the way they think he ought to be educated. And this man walks around and he doesn't think highly of anything and he don't even think highly of their temple. Yeah. And the buildings around there, they, they come out and they said, we want you to see the buildings around here. And he said, oh, you do? Well, there ain't going to be one stone left on another when it's done. That's right. <laughs> now, how does that look? Yeah. And then he calls the, the Pharisees and Sadducees vipers, hypocrites. Mm -hmm. So he's not looking too good in the eyes of the world, is he? No. But there's reason. Alright, so the foolishness and the weakness of God, what is the first part of it? The, the, the foolishness of God mm -hmm. is wiser than men. Why would he let his son... Hang on a curse. Turn to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. <clears throat> Did Jesus 
uh, keep the law perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then, if he's hanging on a tree, well, how does that look? How does that look? Okay. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just, I apologize, the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made what? A curse for you. Did they know that? No. Nope. Then the foolishness of God is wiser than <coughs> men. Men. Okay. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For his written curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. All right. Uh, haven't you ever really sat down and thought about it? Why did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? I mean, there are other ways to die, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They tried to stone him on a... Uh, they were going to throw him off a cliff. Yeah, and he honest. turned and he just walked through them because that was not the way he was going to die. It doesn't say curses everyone that falls off the cliff. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Well, if Galatians chapter 3, 13 means anything, Christ redeemed us from the curse of law, being made a curse for us. What made him a curse? He had our sins on him. He hung on a tree, didn't he not? Mm -hmm. Okay. He says, Curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham. But he didn't just hang on a tree, he hang on a Roman cross tree. Numbered with the transgressors. Yep. He don't look like he's even in good company. Right? He's not in good company. He's not on a good place. He, he don't look right. He, he's not saving Israel. He's not coming down off the cross or calling the angels down. He's not doing anything. My goodness, it looks like God's kind of weak, don't it? He looks weak. God looks weak. I, it looks like God's failed here. That's what the verse is talking about, folks. Man didn't know. Now, verse 14. What's the first word in verse 14? That. What does that mean? What does that mean? That. I'm missing you. I ain't going to apply you get it. If the law is taken out of the way, boom, you can't keep the law. If you, Israel's taken out of the way, you can't bless Israel. Right. right? Right? Back in Genesis, before the law, God made a promise. And that promise involved the fact that He might give to the nation something that nobody knew what He was going to give. Let's see what it says. That. You with me? That. The blessing of who? Abraham. Where's that at? Genesis. Let's see. Genesis 12. Hold on to this. I got something that God let me have that guarantees me I get to go to heaven. Genesis 12. 1. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Okay? What happens if a person cursed Abraham's seed? He was cursed. Okay? What if Abraham's seed was not available? The God of this world knows then that the world, the world has to have Jews to get to God. So he gets the Jews to deny the Son and make God mad at them. Mm -hmm. That's what Satan wanted. Thus, the kingdom would be taken away, and the kingdom, if the kingdom ain't available, then there ain't no way to bless a Jew to get into the kingdom. Then where in the world am I going to go? Man, even the Jehovah's Witnesses don't figure this out yet. 
They think they're going to get the earth. Yeah. Where did it, how do I have a right to go around and tell people I'm going to heaven and teach Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? I miss you. Wake up! That's true. How in the world do I get the claim to go to heaven and teach, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth? I don't know how they even think that they can do that. Or the Beatitudes. The rest of it. Or the parables. How do I have the right to say about heaven? Peter's not telling them that they're going to heaven. He said when the Lord comes. Yeah. Folks, if you're going to walk around and tell people you're going to heaven, you better know why you're going to heaven. Yeah. Now the end of the verse of Genesis 12.3. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Go back to Galatians. That. You see that word, that? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through who? Jesus Christ. Not through the Jews. Through who? Jesus. The one that looked foolish. The one that looked weak. What is it that you must have to go to God? Two things. Have to have His righteousness. To have His righteousness. And the only way you're going to have His righteousness is His faith. Go what? Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of what? The How do you get to go to heaven? God said and revealed it through Paul that you can have the Spirit of His dear Son. Turn to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What did God offer when Jesus Christ died? Buried and rose again. What did He offer when He called Paul? That Holy Spirit of promise. I, I, it's my fault. I died of year and asleep or whatever. That Holy Spirit of promise. If you've read your Ephesian letter, you're going to be very clear on what that is. Look in Romans chapter 8 again, verse 9. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There's another Spirit offered. I mean, if God offers a Spirit, guess what? Satan offers a Spirit. If God offers a Son, Satan offers a Son. You understand there's always parallels. The God of this world is not going to make it easy to understand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of what? Then there's a spirit of the world can be received. That's not your spirit. That's not a man's spirit. Man's got to have his spirit to live. That's another spirit being offered, and that other spirit being offered is offered, and it is an exact the whole idea is 2 Corinthians 4. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. <coughs> in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom? What does that kind of terminology mean? In whom? In other words, it's... If somebody said you got blood in you, it's in you. In whom? Right? Well, here's something. Something has got in this person. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Folks, there's differences in all this stuff. Now here's a warning to a law, a saved person. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 
Verse 1, Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that they may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Then if they have been presented as a chaste virgin, then their mind should be clearly on the fact that they're holy without blame. Right? Right? Right. If they can be convinced later on to confess sins, they have been what verse 3 says. Now watch. He said, but I fear lest by any means as a servant beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Mm-hmm. Tell me what the will of God is. <laughs> then how many can be saved? All. How many will be? Not very many. Them that believe. All them that believe, yeah. Them that believe. Now watch, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I fear lest by any means as a servant be God leave through his subtlety. What does that mean? He's a dealer of underhanded tactics. Right. He went to the woman first. Hmm. I'm not mistaken that Adam went in the garden first. And if I'm not mistaken, the commandment was to him first. Go over here and read it. Well, that poses a problem. Did he tell her the right thing? Or did he add to himself? Because she said, we can't touch it or eat it. God never said they couldn't touch it. They could have played ball with it or whatever it is. They could have hit it with a bat. They could have thrown it. They could hit each other with it, just as long as they didn't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> so she says, we can't touch it, uh, taste it, nor touch it. And then it says, when she saw that it was good for food and pleasant to the eye. Two different things there. I read that and I go, hmm. So this fruit is... Whatever it is, is very good looking. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I'm sure Eve's very good looking. I'm sure Adam is. They're in the image of God. Mm-hmm. But the condition was he's standing there when it all goes about. He didn't do his job. Jesus Christ did. The first Adam failed us. And by the way, you get to see him later if you want to, if you're saved. You can uh, hit him or whatever you want to do. (laughs) Adam failed. Second Adam looks like a failure and does what 1 Corinthians says. Starting in 1 Corinthians 15. Look with me in Hebrews 2 and 1 Corinthians 15. Now watch Hebrews 2, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy, are you with me? Mm-hmm. Him that had the power of death, that is... That one. So who has the power of death? Yeah. Well then read 1 Corinthians 15 with that in mind. Verse 55. Who's he talking to? The devil, evidently. He talking to the devil. The devil, most likely, when this is going on, probably is up there hollering at God, I got you. Wasn't he entered into Judas? Was he not willing for him to die on that cross? Folks, did I miss you? He knows that the law can be fulfilled. Then nobody can do the law because all the sin that comes short of the glory of God. Why? Because he got on Adam. Yeah. All the sin. Mm-hmm. 
then if all have sinned, they got a problem, ain't they? Right. Then is he saying to God, I got them to kill your son? Did I do something wrong? I got him to kill your son. He's 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 dead. Yeah. He didn't get the kingdom set up. They rejected him. They said, "Did you hear him, Lord? Say we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him." Did, are you into sleep or did you die? Are you losing? Well, that's what he's saying to him. And what does God say to him here? Yeah. Oh, death, where's thy sting? Okay. Oh, grave, where's thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. <laughs> I took them all out of the way. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> How is that a wonderful song? Charles, uh, Ralph Stanley couldn't have sung it any better, could he? Oh, Dad! Do you see it, folks? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And if you didn't have God, every work you ever did would not count one thing. Turn to Ephesians 2. Shut up. Watch this. Ephesians 2.10. Okay, Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you are saved through faith. For that not yourselves the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God created Adam, and then He created Eve. If they had to eat of the tree, the fruit would have been just like them. The children. Right? Jesus Christ tempted in all points, knew no sin, and His children are just like Him. Holy and without blame before God. Are you alright? The weakness of God and the foolishness of God beat the devil. And it looked foolish and it looked weak. But it was the greatest thing that ever happened. Amen. Mm -hmm. Christ died for our sins. Mm -hmm. And told me the other day, he said, you know, I knew Christ died for my sins all my life, but I didn't know he died for all my sins. He said, I had the feeling that I was supposed to do the best I could to where I would be entitled to that. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. You're not entitled to it, folks. That's right. It's a gift. It's a gift. What you're entitled to is the lake of fire. Amen. But instead, God gives you eternal life through the faith of His Son. I appreciate you.